Okay. Well, thanks, um, Pastor Anthony, and thanks, folks, for uh, allowing me to come and share my fellowship with you folks. Uh, I am, as an uh, introduction, I was in North London, uh, but I've been there since 1988, and then very recently uh, I came back home, in a sense, um, to New Zealand, and I'm in the Tepuki Fellowship uh, in the Bay of Plenty. Um, just, uh, again, carrying on in a way as a, as a support role, really, to Pastor Alan Butler, who's who's um, very worthily heading up the fellowship there. And uh, it's great to see old familiar faces. <laughs> anyway, it's great. And uh, I want to talk tonight about um, game changes. Game changes in the Bible. And uh, as you may or may not be aware, when I, because I did taught history for 40 years, history seems to be uh, often where I end up talking about game changing events in history. And the Bible itself is the history book, the authoritative one. But game changes are really interesting in the Bible. And as you'd expect to find in secular history as well, game changing either relates to events, things that happened that suddenly changed the game, suddenly changed the circumstances, suddenly changed uh, the normality or the understanding of the world as it was. And then you get people who are game changers who can uh, single individuals or very small groups, men and women, uh, can turn the tide of history. So game-changing events and game-changing people are often very intertwined, and we find the same in the Bible. For example, Abraham is one of the great game-changers because he re-established or began the process of re-establishing the relationship between man and God that had been lost in the Garden of Eden. And what God was looking for is a man who would utterly trust him, utterly rely on him, utterly believe in him, uh, which you could call faith, man of faith. God wasn't looking for a righteous person, man or woman, on their moral conduct and the thoughts and intents of their heart, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He knew he wouldn't find one. He wanted someone who was righteous through faith. And he found one in Abraham. And that was a game-changing event. Thus, the process could continue to repair the terrible damage done by uh the catastrophe in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell away from the Lord. Moses was a game changer. Moses uh, stood for the people in the oppression in Egypt, very long-term oppression of the Hebrew people. He stood for the people. And the Lord found in Moses someone who could turn this people into a nation, turn this people into a living parable of the faults and the virtues of mankind as it struggles to complete the process begun by Abraham to return to the Lord. And as we heard, um, even in the gifts, the idea of first principles, that could they hold to the first principles to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and your neighbor as yourself? Could they hold to honoring God first in everything? Could they hold to following the Lord and keeping his laws and his ordinances and leading them physically 
out of persecution through a protecting shelter of miracles into the wilderness and 40 years of testing as they literally staggered around. Who was there as the game changer? Moses. Because of all the people there, even if you include Aaron and, and, and Miriam, of all the people there, Moses had vision. He was leading the people because he followed God. And he was the game changer. One of his great characteristics was humility. As a leader, a great leader, he was a man of great humility. And even he, as we know, after a series of events, wouldn't get to the promised land, but he would get to lead the people to it. Game-changing event. Ruth was a game changer. Ruth, again, the Lord extending the process, beginning to give the first indications of where he was going with the plan, even beyond this people who had begun with Abraham. Because remember his promise to Abraham that he would create um, from Abraham uh, descendants more than the uh, stars in the heavens, the sands of the sea. So the process had to start expanding. And Ruth was the game changer. And her determination, wonderful story, we can't go into it, but her determination to follow Naomi's God, to follow one God that made sense to her. And she decided if I'm following, then that means follow. And that means being faithful. And that means that circumstances don't mean a thing. What means far more than circumstances? Whether I find myself in famine, whether I find myself in danger, whether I find myself in rejection, what really matters to Ruth is what she believes. And that's what God was looking for someone who would follow, but also someone who, under the understanding of the Jewish people, had no right to follow him. She was a Midianite. She was beyond the pale, as is the old Irish expression. She snatched at the impossible dream. And that's what God was looking for. Here's a game changer. And of course, in the wonderful story, she um, marries Boaz, who himself was a descendant of Rahab, the Canaanite. And they marry, and it's, it's a relationship based on deep love and commitment. And that becomes the line that goes down to King David and on there to Jesus born in the flesh in Bethlehem. There's a game changer. And of course, we come to the New Testament. What's the New Testament all about? Really what we talk, is it just a division in the Bible? Because, well, you've got to have a beginning and an end, so you may as well have a middle. No, if we turn to Acts chapter 24, and verse 21, Paul is on trial. He's on trial for his life, really, uh, before the Roman authorities being brought there by the Sanhedrin. Do you think he should be executed for bless blasphemy and stirring up uh, insurrection? And in Acts chapter 24, we get a reference to the game-changing event in the Bible, in verse 21. Paul says in his defense, except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. 
touching the resurrection of the dead. He preaches the resurrection of Christ. And if we look back in verse 15, Paul cues it in verse 15 when he says, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. So Paul was hinging his whole defense I'm upholding the resurrection. If you want to kill me for that, then kill me for that. If you want to put me in jail for that, put me in jail for that. But I am not shifting. This is what I'm about, the resurrection. Because it is the game changer, the game changer. And who is the personality that allowed that? Christ. And who is the personality or one of the personalities that declared it? Paul. He wasn't alone, though. Because when Christ, the game changer, carried through the game changing event, the resurrection, he opened the door for the Holy Spirit, which opened the door for the foundation of the church. And the foundation of the church meant like us, men and women, like Ruth. Simply going to believe no matter what, no matter what. And Paul's in verse 21, making a great game changing statement. No matter what, I'm not shifting on this. And you could sum up every Christian fellowship on the face of the planet. What do they stand for if you are allowed one sentence? The resurrection. Christ rose from the dead so that we might also rise from the dead. The hope. The hope which separates us immediately but gives us a lifeline to God. When the curtain was rent in two from top to bottom at the resurrection of uh, at the crucifixion of Christ, he cried, it is finished. And the curtain of the temple was rent and a mighty curtain it is too. It symbolized paving the way. The lifeline was now in place. The lifeline that had been planned since Abraham. And it, boy, it had had its tough times. Even if a lifeline is broken, it still remains a lifeline. Sometimes the lifeline was broken in the Old Testament and it was repaired again and broken and repaired again and broken and repaired again. Why? Because it is recognized as a lifeline. Who by the game changes? And as you can see in the history of the church, the great game changers of the early church paid the price of keeping that lifeline open with their lives. Nearly all the apostles died martyrs' deaths, except, I think, for, for John. And they tried to martyr John, and they couldn't. And some of the um, lesser-known ones like Junius and, sorry, Junior and uh, Andronicus, uh, named in... in Rome, the Roman church, they paid with their lives, martyred. Game changes. And their lifeline is carried on by us. And as we heard in, in, um, in the gifts, we live in a very unstable, dangerous world at the moment. It's not beyond... Uh, imagination that we could be called to account like Paul was will you renounce your faith will you reject your faith what you believe for what the state wants to believe and if you don't you pay with your life you might say can't see it happening well there are countries where it's happening already we know that 
our church in Pakistan uh, recently been under terrible oppression, physical oppression. Um, even saints beaten to death in the marketplace. Uh, I know one sister had her arm just broken by the security guards in front of her parents just to prove that they should be paid a bribe not to turn them over to the religious police. And they would not give ground. That's in our fellowship. And there are other fellowships around the world uh, which are persecuted with equal savagery and some fellowships not at all. Do you know how you were persecuted in Australia? And you know how you persecuted in Ireland? Exactly the same way, indifference, contempt, silent mockery. You have to hold the line. You have to keep believing. When uh, Jim, I lo loved hearing Jim's uh, testimony. When he started to search out God, search out the Bible, search out truth, it was one game-changing brother who told him one game-changing thing that Jim's heart wanted to hear. But then Jim becomes a game-changer. This is how the Lord works. The Lord knew that Jim would respond. Now, what's he going to do? Is he going to put that into the, I'll oh, forget that box. It's a bit embarrassing and a bit interesting, but I'll pass on to something else. Or is he going to do something about it? Is he going to do something about it? That's what game changers have to decide. If we go to Romans 5. Romans, you know, all the letters are fantastic because... Paul is often writing to churches under threat where they would be called to account for their belief by authorities for whom life and death didn't very mean very much when they were handing out sentences. Romans were uh, subject to a waves of persecution through the early church. So Paul's writing to people who would know exactly what game-changing stands for. You stand up for what you believe, well, it could be the last day that you stand up for anything. And in Romans 5, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, wherein we stand Game changers must make a stand and rejoice. That's attitude. Like Ruth, the rejoicing's ind independent often of what's going on around you or what's happening to you. Why are you rejoicing? Hope of the glory of God. We're looking for something beyond what we can see and what we can hear and what we can feel. Guess what it's called? Back to Abraham, faith in God, reckoned as righteousness. That's the lifeline. The game-changing event requires game-changers who will pick the event up and say yes and embrace it. You know, during the Second World War, when Britain in 1939, 1940, 1941, Britain was fighting for its life. Most of Europe had fallen before the Nazis. It was considered, uh, even in Britain, only a matter of time in 1940 before the Germans invaded Britain. And they would simply not have enough resources to defend this last outpost of democracy in Europe. And Churchill was prime minister. And he knew two things would have to happen. He would need a game-changing event in defending the island from immediate attack. 
and a game-changing event in surviving and clinging on. They had survived Dunkirk through a miracle after the nation came together in prayer, another game-changing event. The king called the nation to prayer, and the nation responded. And the miracle of Dunkirk took place where 350,000 men were evacuated, when Churchill said it would be wonderful if we could get 40,000 off the beaches. But as Churchill said, wars are not won by evacuations. Defence came again. Then there was the Battle of Britain, and the nation was called to prayer again. And again there was a miracle. And Churchill said famously, never before in the history of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few, talking about those wonderful pilots of the Royal Air Force, game changes again. And Dowding, Hugh Dowding, who was head of the RAF, said, yes, they are wonderful men. But I'm telling you, this was a miracle. And why did he say that? Because the nation came to prayer and a series of events took place that simply enabled them to hang on. You need another game changer. Do you know, that reminded me of our word, revival, fellowship. Revival, yes. Get more people. Preach the gospel. The Bible is full of it. The Lord wants us to preach the gospel in the way we are and preach the gospel in the way we live and preach the gospel and what we say to people when we come across them. No revival, no fellowship. But then the other side is you need the fellowship. No fellowship, no revival. And what is the fellowship? The fellowship is the survival technique. The fellowship is bunker mentality, not look, looking in, but bunker mentality, looking out. After the Battle of Britain, Churchill knew that Britain had to develop a bunker mentality, looking out for opportunities to win, but surviving. That's what the church does. That's why we have Acts 2 and Pentecost and the beginning of the church and 3,000 people baptized because God knows that one or two scattered people across planet Earth are not going to change anything. In fact, after a while, they will cease to exist. The principles of democracy, because they are written in books and seem like good ideas, would not survive in Europe if Britain ceased to exist. They would simply vanish and be burnt with the books. You need flesh and blood and you need spirit. And if we go uh, to Romans uh, 16, And Paul had written this letter with these wonderful chapters, Romans 8, Romans um, 5, Romans 15, and the other chapters. Who to? To these people mentioned in chapter 16. Co and he commends them. They're all game changers, and they're, they're all living on the edge. They will have all known what persecution was like. You know, a sudden knocking at the door, armed soldiers bursting in or holding a meeting and a mob outside. The threat of death, the threat of poisoning, the threat of being thrown into the arena. They knew, and yet Paul commends them. And we haven't got time to read the whole chapter, but I love reading this list. First of all, he commends even the lady who brought the letter from Corinth. It was a very dangerous exercise in those days, traveling 
and he chose Phoebe from the church at Cancria, which is the port at Corinth, to carry the letter. I commend unto you Phoebe, our, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Cancria, that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succorer, a helper of many and of myself also. Then he goes on, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus who have for my life laid down their own necks, and to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epinatus, first fruits of Archaea under Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia. I mentioned them earlier. Very strong church history says they were both martyred. They'd been previously arrested and imprisoned. And now, later on, they were martyred for their belief. And my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who are also in Christ before me, greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachis, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which is our Aristobulus's household. When you look at the church history, again, it's not scripture, but it's pretty verifiable church history about Aristobulus. He only gets one event. He was a mighty man of God. There is such strong evidence that he set up the first church in Wales and that he was part of an underground network that was smuggling Christians out of Rome to get them clear of persecutions and that when the heat got too hot for him because he was actually um, related to the royal household and you, it was illegal to be a Christian he went to the British Isles it wasn't called the British Isles then he went to Britannia and established a church in Wales Fantastic. He gets one mention in the Bible, his name, Aristobulus's household. We are just scratching the surface of these game changes and the events they had. And I know that they, they would be commending you and Paul would be commending you. You know, in the Second World War, how did they survive? Well, it's summed up in four words, the Battle of the Atlantic, the Battle of the Atlantic. There was a lifeline from America to Britain, bringing supplies by merchant ship across the Atlantic. And when, while Britain could feed itself and be fed, while Britain could have munitions sent to it and support sent to it, not troops at this stage, but weapons, munitions, supplies, food, Britain could survive and be a thorn in the side of the Nazis. The fellowship in Ireland, the fellowships in Australia, the fellowships all over the world are thorns in the side of Satan. And your mere survival is a triumph for the Lord. But Churchill famously said, and I'll read the quote, <laughs> he said, the only thing that really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril, because the lifeline across the Atlantic was threatened by the U-boats. The Germans knew if they could cut the lifeline, the war was over. Britain would simply starve to death and have to surrender and starved very quickly. Churchill knew at one stage that Britain was in within a fortnight of starvation. It needed a game changer. The lifeline itself was a game changer to keep Britain in the game. But as we've seen in the history of the Bible, game changers need people to keep the lifeline operating. The church at Rome, 
isn't just a series of words in a book on paper. The Church of Rome, they're there. You see them. They're all named. It's not a big church. How important is that church? Because of the letter? Yes. But because of what they inspired Paul to write through the Spirit, because of their stand, he was actually desperate to get to Rome. He, he was just so impressed by them and their courage. That's what, you know, we commend Moses, we commend Abraham, we commend Ruth and all the other giants in the Old Testament through their faith and et cetera, et cetera. But they're swept along by these game-changing events, which they either become part of or they ignore or they fall away, as the expression goes. And I see so many parallels in history, but the striking one is the Battle of the Atlantic. That was the one that Britain had to win. Just to give you an idea of how savage it was, and uh, Churchill said, uh, there are many reasons that people have fought wars down through history, and not all moral or satisfactory or adequate or worthy, and mostly through the weakness of man and the depravity of man and the greed of man. But he said, now we fight a war of good versus evil. He saw it so clearly. And he simply said, we must win this war. Even though when he said it at the time, he couldn't possibly see how that could be. I think four times the nation was called to prayer during the Second World War. Would we have it happen today? I don't know. But the losses during the Battle of the Atlantic, can you? I can't even get my head around this. 3,500 merchant ships were sunk. Millions upon millions of tons of munitions and supplies went to the bottom of the Atlantic. 36,000 merchant marine crew were lost. 175 British warships were sunk. And that also included some of the Allied warships that had escaped as the Nazis swept um, across Europe uh, from Poland, from the Baltic, uh, from France. 175 warships and thousands of crew on those ships. And the U-boats themselves were so determined to win the war, they were told they could win the war if they starved Britain to death. 783 U-boats were sunk and 47 German warships. And hundreds of planes on both sides went down. Why? Because it was the lifeline that was going to decide the result in the Second World War. Nearly there with the talk. But interestingly, what made the lifeline work? What kept it open? One word, vision. Churchill had vision and those who supported him and worked for him right down to the crew on the ships, on the escort ships and on the merchant ships and to the Wrens, the naval women working in Liverpool, in Derby House, and in Londonderry, in what was called the Stone Frigate, decoding signals, working out coordinates, constantly in touch from Derry and um, Derby House in Liverpool with the merchant ships and the escort ships telling them of warning them of attacks. And on this terrible wall in Derby House, 
recording the losses of the merchant ships, recording the calls of alarm and emergency as they came in, as ships were torpedoed. They had vision. And as one historian pointed out, for example, there were 200 uh, women working in Derby House, Wren's Women Royal Naval Corps, who only had one job, and that was to change the game. They were literally gamers. That's what they were called. And they developed a game called the Game of Birds and Wolves. These women, with their commanding officer, a man called Roberts, retired naval officer, changed the game by developing a game. <clears throat> they developed a game on a board, and it was highly sophisticated game, to work out how the escort ships could calculate where the U-boats would be and what to do when they worked out the approximate position of a U-boat and to work out from coded signals and earlier experiences of U-boats and experiences of marine crew and escort crew what the German tactics were and how to outwit them on a board in Derby House. They pushed the lives of men and women around <laughs> on the board. And they called it their game of birds and wolves. It was so successful as game changers, they were so successful that 5,000 naval officers visited Derby House and took part in the games and then went and boarded the escort vessels to guide the convoys across. Long story short, I'll be here till Christmas otherwise. It was not the only factor that won the Battle of, Water of uh, Waterloo, of the Battle of the Atlantic. No game changer operates independent of other factors. There are always other factors. But it was critical for the survival. When the Wrens took over and with Gilbert Roberts started developing this game, there was a red line on the board in Derby House right at the top of the chart where with the bar graphs recorded the merchant losses, merchant marine losses. And when the bar graph hit the red line, Britain was in a state of starvation and could only last a fortnight at the most before it had to surrender. When they took over, the bar was just below the red line. They turned the red line, along with the other factors. But they had vision, and they didn't break. And the great thing was, just summing up, their vision perfectly coincided with the vision of Winston Churchill. It perfectly coincided with the vision of the crews on the merchant marine ships and on the escort carriers. And to Churchill's amazement, it perfectly coincided with the vision of the average man and woman in the street in Britain. The Germans could not believe the stamina of the British public. They could not believe in how stubborn they were. In fact, they've got a German intelligence report that was captured in Paris when the Allies reoccupied Paris which said that they're the one thing that will defeat us. It's the stamina of the British. They said we have better soldiers, we have better training, we have better equipment, we have better know-how, but we will be defeated by their stamina. Revival Fellowship. One of the core issues in Revival Fellowship is stamina, spiritual stamina. No matter what the world might say, no matter what the TV says or the press says or the latest moral viewpoint or political decision, doesn't matter a hill of beans. We're following God. And we have a lifeline. It's called the Bible. And we have a lifeline. It's called the people who have gone before us. 
and we have a lifeline it's called the holy spirit and we have a lifeline it's called touching the resurrection that's why you're having to listen to me today <laughs> and be very patient as i sign off it's touching the resurrection we believe in the risen lord and because we believe in the risen lord here we make our stand your game changes. Amen.